Katie Anna, and welcome to our brand new series from Change to Change, hosted by Voice of the Experience, otherwise known as Vote. My name is Marcus Simmons, uh, better known as Chachi, and I am a formerly incarcerated, just as involved individual, and I'm a chapter organizer for the Lafayette chapter. And I'll let my coworker introduce herself. Good evening, and I too am a formerly incarcerated person. I'm Consuela Sway Gaines. I'm an organizer right here in Lafayette. And um, like I said, this is a brand new series. So uh, I, I feel that we felt that it would only be right to have as a host the person who is responsible for the endurance, uh, the struggle of starting this program, starting this organization as well as responsible for the success of where it's at today um and by no further ado i'd like to introduce mr norris henderson director and founder of voice of the experience uh thanks mark thanks for the intro sway uh one i'm glad to be here first and foremost man kind of like excited you know about the uh television program y'all kind of like stepping up <laughs> stepping out you know yeah. Uh, my, I like Marcus said, my name is Nari Simpson. I'm the executive director and founder of Voice Experience. Uh, this organization was founded in 2004, but this organization is actually the progeny of the Anglo Special Civic Project. And the Anglo Special Civic Project was founded by myself and several other guys, some of the guys you hear from uh, later on in the program, uh, while we was in the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. And most of the time people ask the question, well, how did y'all start this? Or what reason y'all started this? Well, it was at a time when we was under a federal consent decree, the prison was. And the reason we had the consent decree because there was a lot of hopelessness going on in the prison. And uh, there were kind of like suicides, you know, staff on inmate violence, inmate on staff violence. And uh, it was just kind of crazy during that time. And there was this pro, uh, procrastinator pro, who predicting that uh, Angola is going to have the worst prison ride in the history of this country. And we kind of like started looking at each other and was like, hmm, and nobody gave us that memo. And so we kind of like started making decisions then. What do we want to change our conditions? So we want to change our circumstances. And so out of that came the Angola Special Civic Project because we opted for the latter. We wanted to change our circumstances. We wasn't worried about the conditions. Uh, that prison, uh, maybe some people know, but that prison is 18,000 acres large. And, uh, you know, for folks, you know, the kind of like thinking was like, if we set the place on fire, they can move us five miles in any direction. And we won't even be able to see the smoke from where we set it on fire yet. So we realized that wasn't the solution to our problem. And so we started using our talents. You know, I worked in the prison law library. Matter of fact, the core group of us worked in the prison law library, the Angolite, uh, and the uh, radio station. And we had a lot of other jailhouse lawyers that uh, initially were part of the project when we got started. And we decided that, uh, look, let's try to figure this thing out. We figured out if I went to prison in Mississippi, how much time would I serve for the very same crime? And so we did a 10-state study about the five major crimes that most of us was in prison from, from first-degree murder, second-degree murder, armed robbery, manslaughter, kidnapping, and, uh, and, 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 and so on. And so we kind of like started researching and we wrote all of the secretaries of states across America and when we got the results back, we put all the information together into a portfolio. We created a white paper about some alternatives to what incarceration should look like. And uh, it's kind of funny, you know, when you start on these journeys, uh, they become just that. You don't have a destination. We didn't know what it was going to look like when we started. We just kind of like started doing something, being proactive to tell our story about what our circumstances were. And uh, 
it took us to another level because we realized then that Louisiana was the outlier in all this stuff that we're doing. And so I think that goes towards how we got started. So just fast forward, this was in, and in, in, uh, mind you now, this was like in the 80s. This was like the, the mid 80s, uh, late 86, early 87, uh, when we kind of like started the Civic Project. And we again started this primarily because we wanted to educate and organize our families and friends around a voting block. And it was during the gubernatorial election between Governor Edward, Edward Edwards and uh, Charles Buddy Roma. And uh, we was like, we knew what the conditions would be if Edwards stayed in office as opposed to uh, uh, Charles Roman getting in office based upon, you know, how they was talking about what incarceration looks like. And I remember being in the prison law library and uh, Mr. Roma visited the prison, him and his uh, person of uh, his administrative assistant. And he said that prisons was a growth industry. And that kind of like, I looked at Chico and Chico looked at me and that kind of like scared me to the extent that people saw us as a commodity, you know? And so we really just kind of like buckled down and started doing all the research we could do and how we can go about telling our story. So long story short, that's how we kind of like actually conceived this project. And, uh, you know, when we first started this, the folks in the prison actually thought we were trying to overthrow the prison. It was like, no, y'all got this twisted. We're trying to get out the prison. <laughs> y'all can have y'all prison. Yeah. We're trying to figure out a way to get out of here. And so that became the, the, the springboard for where we at today. Fast forward, what, in 87 to 2003 when I got out, and uh, one year to the date, March 23rd of 2003, I got released from prison, and March 23rd of 2004, I incorporated both. Right, right, right. Well, I, I, I really appreciate the fact, man, that uh, you had what it took to, to, to start this mission, because this mission has helped thousands and thousands of people, you know, um, and when you stop and you mention Buddy Roma, you know, half of the people that we're fighting for today don't even know who <coughs> Buddy Roma probably was. That's right. how long that's been. Right, 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 right. right. And you know, when you think back at that, I, I, you know, I'd be kind of remiss not to mention this guy because, uh, you know, the guy who was the co director, the co chairman with me was uh, Kenny Biggie Johnston, man. And Biggie, you know, he passed away a few months ago, but Biggie, you know, just had this vision, man. He had this vision, man, that we can figure this thing out. You know, it's not rocket science. And so we started on this path, man. Just like you say again, when you look back at it, you know, I've been home 20 years, and we started this 20 years while I was still inside. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So you're talking about, man, this has been 40-something year journey, man, almost you know, 47, almost close to a 50 year journey of us trying to tell this story and trying to educate and wake people up. When we went in prison, there wasn't no such terms as mass incarceration. That didn't even exist. They didn't even coin those phrases until, you know, the campaign, the, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, right. all these things popped up and we realized then people start winding up in prison. And so, yeah, I'm just blessed, man. You know, a lot of people give me a lot of credit for this, but, you know, I, I tell people all the time, God put people where they need to be, and I'm just a vehicle, man, that God is using uh, to do this work. Right, right, right. I, me, myself, I'm a firm believer in people understanding uh, the, the, the struggle that it takes for, you know, to, it, you know, you, you know, the strength that it takes for people to get on a mission going against the grain, especially at a time when you're already in, in, in a bondage, right? right? So, so, I, I, so this question is for me, Mr. Mr. Henderson. What, so that people could, 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 could get a clear vision of, of, of what it took for both to get here, could you tell people what are some of the, some of the pains and the, and, and, and the, 
the, the, the, I don't know, just some of the struggles that you went through just to get both to this point? Well, the initial personal, struggle. Personal no, the, 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 the initial struggle was internally was convincing everybody inside the prison with us that this was the right thing for us to do. You know, because one of the things inside prison, as pretty much folks will know, is like the question always comes up, who put you in charge? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, me being one of the younger guys in the group is almost right. like, well, no, no, how, how you get to tell us what to do? Right, right. And so convincing folks that this was about, and one of the things what was the biggest struggle for us was that when we start saying that, okay, if you commit this crime, you have to stay in prison this amount of time, Oh man, that was kind of like Katie bought it though. Folks were like, well, who are you to say how much time I stay in prison? And so that became a big issue. But the biggest thing was we didn't have anything. The vast majority of us were serving life sentences or practical life sentences, meaning we had 98, 198 years, uh, 200 years, something like that, with no possibility of getting out. So we had to start somewhere. So that was the biggest struggle. The other struggle was the sacrifices in the sense of time, energy, and commitment, man, because, you know, we, we, we suffered, man. We suffered in the sense that, you know, me and Biggie, uh, you know, we got locked up because uh, we folks thought we were trying to start an insurrection inside right. the prison when right. all we were doing right. was trying right. to find a way out. And so it's those kind of like little sacrifices. But, you know, again, man, uh, for anything worth having is worth fighting and waiting for, you know. And so we figured, well, you know, we're doing the right thing. You know, it was just like trying to convince these folks that we're doing the right thing. And right. Uh, so that, that it, early struggle was that. The struggle past that, the post-incarceration struggle, has been pretty much the same thing, man. Uh, trying to convince our folks, you know, when I say our folks, formerly incarcerated folks and their families, why they should be engaged in this work. And, uh, you know, I tell folks, we were talking earlier that we have a chapter in New Orleans, one in Baton Rouge, one in Lafayette. We had one in Shreveport that didn't just work out just yet. And the reason we chose these particular areas because these areas are the feeder to the prison system. Right. And so we figured if we can get any traction somewhere, certainly it should be in these communities where our folks are coming from, right. that they have a vested interest to kind of like, skirt, slow the train down, you know? And so this is why one, why we're here, and I'm excited that we're here in Lafayette, uh, especially with, you know, folks who represent the mission itself. You know, it's not like somebody else is trying to tell our story. We are telling our own story. Right. This is why we're involved. This is why we engage. This is what we put into this. And I am just glad, like I say again, man, that we have been able to plant our flag you know, in different spaces and continually to plant our flag uh, throughout the state and, uh, you know, raising up this thing. Because, you know, like I said, again, we initially started, man, trying to figure out how to get out. Most mission is not only how to get out, but how to stay out. Stay out. You know? Right, right, right. So, Norris, with, with all of that, I mean, you've been doing this, like you said, almost close to 50 years, right? And you've seen a lot of things. Voters had some victories. Voters had some losses. So what can you say to date is the thing that you're most proud of that vote has been able to accomplish over the years? I, I, it, it's, that's, that's the hardest question for me to put my finger on this one single thing. Mm -hmm. But I would have to say getting the right to vote the right to vote for former incarcerated people. And the reason I go to that one first, I default to that one, because when I was in the library researching and just got tired of researching what I was researching, just started researching the Constitution and realized that former incarcerated people had the right to vote. Now, mind we we talking about this is like in the early 80s. And when I started kind of like asking, I said, wait a minute, man, I just read this. Ex explain this to me. And then folks start saying, agreeing with me that I was right in my interpretation of what our Constitution said. I was like, well, why nobody ain't registering our folks? Mm -hmm. And so I started reaching outside the prison, started writing op-ed, letter to the editors, 
reaching out to all the big alphabet organizations. Hey, man, why don't you help register our folks outside? And they would write back and like, oh, why don't you go to prison and lose your right to vote? And I'm like, no, 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 man. That ain't what our Constitution say. Our Constitution changed in 1974. And nobody paid attention to it. And so we became like the Pied Piper of telling people, hey, man, you have the right to vote. You need to register and vote. And so we kept kind of like, you know, tooting our horn and kept pushing the envelope. And finally, when the, we got Act 636 passed to give the right to vote to people who was actually on supervision. Because we initially our Constitution didn't bar anybody from voting. Once you got out of prison, you had the right to vote. Our legislature, 144 people, now mind what I'm thinking to say, overrode the will of the people who changed our Constitution who said that anybody that's not in prison had the right to vote. So the legislature went back and they interpreted what an order of incarceration meant and they said people on probation and parole. So from 80, from, I'm taking it back, from 1976 all the way to 2017, we have been fighting that interpretation of the law until finally they relented and now they allow formerly incarcerated people that's on supervision actually to register and vote. That was, I, I guess, because VOTE, that's what it started about, voting. So that would be the, the, the one big thing. But, you know, we played a major role in the, the Justice Reinvestment Act. You know, we played, matter of fact, I was the campaign manager for the non-unanimous jury verdict constitutional amendment. So I, we have done a lot of stuff. But our mission was about voting and getting our folks to vote. And so I would say 636, matter of fact, it's kind of coincidental, but the last three digits on my license plate is 636. Wow. It's coincidental. <laughs> it's coincidental. I didn't wow. choose that. It was just coincidental, <laughs> you know? So uh, I, I would say, I, I would agree to say that uh, voting rights was uh, the thing because that's where our strength lies in our community. Um, you know, uh, that's how we build community. You know, we build community by being civically engaged. Right. So, 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 Mr. Norris, real quick, how would you say that vote submission would affect both urban and rural communities? Oh man, everybody winds up in the prison. And so, our mission, man, is to educate people and kind of like start kind of like letting people divide us. Because I met so many people in prison from all these little I never knew what tick fall was until I saw somebody in prison. Yeah. And most of the time when you call folks from the rural area, you usually call them by where they come from. Come you from. know, uh, like one of the guys, was called Luscious. He was from Luscious. You know, I didn't know where that was at. I'm from New Orleans. And so it impacted all these places. Today when I drive through these places and you go through these little small communities, I'm like, man, how could you get in trouble in a place like right, this? Right. You know, and so this became, you know, just like Buddy Roman said, prison was a growth industry. And right. people started building prisons, man. Prisons right. became the economic development for these rural communities. And the thing about it was, was the people in the rural communities, their children began to suffer because they became right. the commodities that went right. into those very right. same places. Right. And so, no, this is, this, this is, not just an urban thing, this is urban and rural, and right. everything in between right. Right. Uh, is impacted by this. Because if you look at it now, yeah, there's a, 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 the majority of folks in the prison system are from the urban areas, only because there are more people in urban areas. Right. But in these rural communities, there's a lot of folks in these prisons uh, from these rural communities. So right. this is how we want to really reach out to folks the in-between places, the places in between Lafayette and Lake Charles, in between Lafayette and Opelousas, in between Opelousas and Alexandria, you know, all right. those in-between right. places where we know, uh, I remember a guy uh, came from up around uh, Zueli, and I was like, where in the heck is that, you know? Yeah. I never heard of it. It's up around Shreveport, mm -hmm. you know, and it's kind of yeah. like Z-W-O-L-E, and I was kind of like, Z. Woley said, no, man, that's not how you pronounce it, you know, but these little probably places like that where people come to prison 
And the thing about it is that, uh, you know, everybody suffers when the folks come to prison, be you from an urban community right. or a rural community. Right. But uh, yeah, so no, this mission, our mission is to kind of like spotlight all of this, trying to engage people to get involved and be a part of what we're trying to do. Because this can happen to anybody. Oh yes, this oh, can happen to anybody. This yeah. can happen to anybody. I mean, we lead the nation for capital incarceration, but we all lead, also lead the nation in exonerations. Now, we wow. that ain't supposed to be on wow. the same parallel right, track. Right, right, right. That ain't supposed to be on the same right. parallel track. We also lead the nation in incarceration. We also lead the nation, they say, in crime. Shouldn't be on the same parallel track. Right. So it's obvious right. something we're not doing right. right. Putting people in prison isn't the solution to the problems because, you know, most of these things are systemic problems, you know. Lack of education, we're 50. You know, poverty, we ain't kind of like between 45 and 50. Uh, 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 education, same thing, dead last. So, you know, all of these things contribute to this prison industrial complex. And so we're trying to educate people about how these things happen. It's not by happenstance. A lot of this stuff is by design. Okay, and, and you are correct, you are correct. So Mr. Norris, it's a pleasure. Pleasure is mine. Pleasure is mine. Please come back. I will. Very I will. soon. Don't, yes. don't, don't, don't be a stranger. No, we ain't but hop, skip, and a jump. You yes. know? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, and now we have our voters organized to educate Director of Policy, Mr. Chico Yancey. Thank you, Chico, for coming and joining us on our new show. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, no problem. Come a long way away from choir director. Now you're actually <laughs> interviewing people. We'll talk about yes, that Yes, yes, yeah. definitely have come a long way. And speaking of coming a long way earlier, NARS mentioned about Act 636, and I know how that particular hmm. law really impacted you. Can you share with our folks here in Acadiana the importance of Act 636? Well, the importance of Act 636, and you know, you know, every time I think about it, in fact, I talked to Pat Smith today, she was the author of the bill. Uh, she, at that time, she was State Representative Pat Smith. And, uh, you know, the day we were talking about, we've come a long, long way with Act 636. And, you know, we were fighting that and trying to get that. You know, we were lobbying in the legislature, going to people and uh, trying to get the rep representatives to come forward to do it. We had lost it five years in a row. Uh, and the one thing about Pat Smith, she would always say, I'll be back. So it gave us courage, you know, with Biggie. And, you know, Biggie played a big part because he had been out, been out of prison for over 20, 20 years or something like that. But he still couldn't register to vote. And Pat, mm -hmm. well, Pat was down on, we're going to get this straight and got it done. And we were able to get it done. Uh, and when we got it, it was unbelievable. The person that really pushed it was a senator. Uh, that actually pushed it over and gave us the, the, the fight to say, hey, we got not a right to vote. So uh, you probably were the first formerly incarcerated person on parole voting <laughs> when your time came. Because I know you always, you beat people to the poll. You beat people to the polls. And that's amazing because we're formerly incarcerated, but we're the first ones there. Well, my thing is that I, I, I coined the slogan, I will beat you to the polls. And I was trying to really stir the people up. You wouldn't want a person that's out of prison to beat you to the polls, and you've been free all your life, and you you lay, lay around and lollygag. Mm -hmm. uh, when the polls open for me, early voting, I go vote. I shoot it out to everybody, and hey, I beat you to the polls. You know, everybody else was trying to get to the polls. But, you know, it felt good to vote. Mm -hmm. It felt good to get my citizenship back. Because before I went to prison, I was very active in, in the community and doing stuff like that. And uh, when I lost it, 
you know, it feels like you done lost a part of your, your soul. But getting it back, it was such a joy. I remember Pat Smith, and we, we cried for 30 minutes or so, you know, and there were people in the, in the audience of the Senate, on the Senate side of the chamber, they were like crying with us because guess what? That was a major, major ordeal. And mm -hmm. in fact, Norris and uh, Bruce, they was out of town. They, they showed us pictures later that when they were cheering because Senator Dan Clater had, uh, had gave his speech because I tried to lobby him. And you know, people don't understand when you're in the, in the Capitol and you're trying to get bills passed and you're trying to get stuff changed, you got to actually beg people and lobbying and you got to go to them, you got to give them the spiel, you got right, to keep right, at right. them and everything. Right, right. And uh, I would be with Clayton almost every day if he passed by the lunchroom or whatever, and I would try to get it. He said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do it and all that. And at one point, I told him, I said, I got letters from the saints. I got letters from the church. Uh, I got letters from people out of town and everything. He said, ah, I don't mean nothing to me and everything. But when he got up that day and he said about voting, he says, people come into my office and they complain. He said, the first thing I do before I make the appointment with them, I pull up to see if they're a registered voter. Mm. And, I, and he looks and see if you done voted, if you're not a registered voter. And it was kind of crazy the way he said it. He said, I tell people, if you don't like what I'm doing, find me. But if you ain't a registered voter, you can't find me. So I understood the importance of voting. And uh, you know, I was just happy to get my vote. And now, hey, I'm to the polls. I'm the first one. Now you're trying to beat me. I am. Okay. I am. So you got your voting rights you. now, you know. But yes. this, it's still, it was this day before I, I came to Lafayette. A uh, young man I met Saturday, we were tabling at an at a event for the mayor. And this brother was in prison with me. I didn't recognize the face. He had changed, uh, as we all do. But he recognized me. But I found out he was not registered. But guess what? He'll be registered tomorrow. Awesome. You know, that's what, awesome. that's what it's about. It's one, one at a time because Nora said something earlier. We discovered there's over 40 to 70,000 former incarcerated people in the state of Louisiana that may be eligible to register to vote. That's a lot. Well, it's a voting box. Mm -hmm. You know, and what Nora didn't say is doing what we're doing, you're waking up that sleeping giant. Yeah. What is the sleeping giant? The sleeping giant is the people that didn't have any say so. Everybody else can do everything they're doing, but now I got to vote so I can change things. Right. And when people tell me that my vote don't count, they're going to do what they want to do. Right. And I have a specific race that I can go to. We had a judgeship race in Baton Rouge. The judge won by two votes. Oh, wow. So if he'd have got, if the other guy would have got his cousin, girlfriend, or whatever, right. and, and got him to the polls, he probably could have won. Yeah. So when somebody tells me their vote don't count, right. if somebody wins by two votes, that means that every vote, what? Counts. counts. counts so that's, wh that's where I am with that. You know, so my job is to, uh, you know, sometimes I'm begging people. I'm pleading, you know. Uh, I bring them to, I, you know, if they say they're going to vote, come to the office. Let's get in the car, and we're going to ride there. I'm going to stand there with you and let you do your thing, and then we're going to take a picture. And then I got to make sure that I got it in my log that when the election comes, hey, bro, you got your card, so let's go vote. Yeah. So how can a formerly incarcerated person get registered to vote? Because I think that's probably the issue with a lot of people First, they had to find out that they can register to vote. So now that they know that they can possibly get registered to vote, what does a person have to do? Uh, it was cumbersome for me, but it was worth it. You know, you have to go to probation, parole. You have to get the letter that says now that you've been out of prison five years and you've been straight and everything. They give you that certified letter. You take that letter from probation and parole, then you go to the register's office. Mm -hmm. And then when I first did it, you had to, to bring all kinds of ID and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I had everything ready. But the thing about it is when you're doing that, you're hindering people in one way, you know? Mm -hmm. But the people understand that, hey, you go to probation and parole every month. 
So ask the people. At one time, you had to go. Uh, Bruce, Norris, and other people got together. We got with DOC, and guess what? You can call your probation officer now, and they'll mail you a letter. Mm -hmm. So we've made it more simple and everything, but we don't even like that. Right. My, my argument has always been, when I got convicted of my crime and I went to prison, you found a way to automatically take me off. Right. right. So my thing is right. that if you hit the five-year mark, and that's your benchmark, and computers now can do everything else, why not when you hit that five-year mark, boom, spit him out or spit her out, right. and hey, right. let that people person register. Right. So, so we're that, trying to make it easy. So that know? is something that VOTE is currently working on. Oh, yeah, we're currently working on that. It's, you know, we... <laughs> We are actually, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be victorious. We're going to get it done. Don't yeah, worry. That's what I feel. We're going to be victorious. Just so like we that. were able to get X636 passed, we'll simplify the voting registration. And, and I got a little quote down there since you're saying this about voting is your opportunity to get back into the mainstream mm -hmm. and have a say so. And when I saw this, it says opportunity usually shows up in overalls. Hmm. And it looks like work. It is a little work to go do these things, right. it is. but it pays off in the end right. because I've seen guys and when they vote and then later they actually get a chance to vote. Actually, when we do our lobby day, we're asking people to come out, go know who your representative is, know who your state senator mm -hmm. is. And when people get a chance to see, oh, they're just regular people like me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we yes. said, Nara said something sometime today. They put their pants on one leg at a time, you know? So you let folks know that, and the other slogan we have, and you've been there, Sway and Marcus, whose house? Our oh, house. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, see, that's what I'm saying. It's our house, so we pay those people. Yes. Right. We pay their salaries and everything. You know, when I testified, I wanted to give up my voting rights if you say I ain't got to pay no more taxes. Hmm. And uh, uh, so Representative bad. Smith said, you know what, Mr. Yancey, I think I'd go for that deal too because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, taxation without representation. You're taking my money, but you say I have no right. say so. Right. So that's, that was the thing, if you have a say so in your community and understand, and that you can make a change. Yes. And guess what? It's civics that we took in grade school of the executive branch and the judicial branch and all. We took that in school, yes. but we didn't look at it, what it was going on. No. But when you get See. in the real world, you can realize your state representative can help you. Your state senator can help you, you know? So therefore now the governor can help, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to have that ability to get up off your behind and go do some work. And the work is sign the paper, register and go vote. A lot of people are under the misconception that they only need to vote in the bigger elections, like the presidential election. What about the smaller elections, the local elections, the mayor, the city council, things like that? You must have been on my desk this morning. Uh, I've outlined in my little spiel that I'm getting ready to do to people is from the school board all the way, just what you said, everybody plays a part in your community, mm -hmm. makes the rules for your community, and you have no say so. Well, you have some say so because you can get out and vote, you mm -hmm. know, and that's what you got to do. You get out and vote, and then you change things. And then, first of all, you need to be involved in your community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just think, here, here mm -hmm. we are, former incarcerated people. Yep. We're supposed to be the worst of the worst and all of that, and we're out here now being civil-minded, citizens of our community paying taxes and letting folks know that voting is very important. Right. And guess what? If we don't get out and vote this upcoming governor's election, we could be back to a Roma, Jindal, Foster years. I can remember in those years that not just the prison population, but it suffered all over the state. Over the but then in prison, nobody was going home. Right. And then you had this other boy that 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 general, whatever his name is, he closed the whole hospital down. Right. And you know, and you know, so we need to make sure the people that we put in office are gonna do not just what I say, but at least be a part and let the community have some say so. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect sir. sense. Perfect sense. And you know, we we have a battle cry that vote does and you always lead that what is the history 
behind it? Well, the history came from prison. Uh, it actually came uh, from a former warden, and he was the first black warden, uh, Larry Smith, uh, that came to Angola. And he, he came to Angola by way of the wardens there getting in trouble with uh, dog fighting and all that kind of stuff. So those wardens got kicked out, and they allowed Larry Smith, a black man, temporarily to come in and be the warden. Well, when he got there, we found out that <laughs> there were more people against him on the outside, and the people that was with him was the guys on the inside. Mm. So once he came with us and he saw what we were trying to do, he applauded what we was doing. He just told Norris, he said, hey, you guys need a ballot cry. Mm. And he said, what is this? That no surrender, no retreat. So when I say no surrender, no, no retreat. retreat, that's where it comes from. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Chico, for giving us the history and letting our folks know how important it is to get registered to vote. Well, anybody that's listening right now that's a former incarcerated person, if you've been out five years, whether you're on parole, probation, guess what? You can call my number, 225-270-5245, although I'm in, Lou in Baton Rouge, but I don't have a problem, and I take calls from all over the state, okay? So again, my phone number is 225-270-5245. If you want more information, you got Sway and them here, uh, and you got Matt, all the, all the, uh, the Lafayette uh, core people here that's doing the same thing. But the thing about it is it's so easy to do it. All you need to do, again, we've uh, streamlined it. We're trying to streamline it more, but right now you can call the probation office where you have to go and let them know to check and see, let them know you want to register to vote. And guess what? They can mail you that letter or you can go pick it up. And that's how easy it is to get registered as a FIP. And FIP stand for formerly incarcerated persons. And we changed the language. I hate that term convict. I hate that term offender. Uh, I hate that, that thing, old thing, and all that. Uh, when I first went to prison, you were a convict, then you became an inmate, and then now everybody's an offender. But, you know, people say offender, that means you're still doing something. Right, right. right. But we're not trying to offend anybody. Right. We're trying to get into the meat of the matter to make sure our communities, and we have a say-so in what's happening. And guess what? When you vote, in New Orleans, we have changed, we've won numerous elections. Right. In Baton Rouge, we've won a few elections. Mm -hmm. Lafayette is getting into it to win a few elections. But the, 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 the best part is educating people. Right. Yes. It's, it's hard to get people, since 1965, the Voting Rights Act, and we are still, this is 2023, we still got to beg our people to register, right. and then we got to beg them to go to the polls. Yes. You don't have to beg me to go to the polls. I'm gonna beat you to the polls. Yes. But then why not? Let's have a little contest. Beat me to the polls. I'm gonna beat you, Chico. I will beat you this time. <laughs> no surrender. No, no retreat. retreat. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Matthew Green. I am a member of Vote here in Lafayette. I'm also the leader of the member policy team here in Lafayette. Um, and we are joined by our next guest, Ronald Marshall. If you please introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. My name is Ronald Marshall, policy analyst at Voice of Experience. And I'm happy to be here with you guys today. All right. Um, so to get us started, what are some things that people need to know about policy, what the policy team does, what you do as a policy analyst um, that are important for everybody to know about how VOTE is in, engaged in shaping policy in Louisiana? Well, when I first came to VOTE, I didn't know absolutely anything about policy. But I think Mr. Norris, his words were to me, man, you got this. Same thing you've been doing on the inside, same thing you're going to be doing out here. And when I sat in the office, I realized, yeah, this is what I've been doing for the last 25 years. But what I've learned in my two years at VOTE is that the biggest, one of the biggest things about this policy work is maintaining and developing relationships. You have to have the people, the representatives in your corner as well as you being in their corners because without representatives, we can't get any of our bills on the floors and committees. So that's, that's very important to make, to develop those relationships 
and maintain those relationships and cultivate them and watch them flourish. So that's what I've been doing for the last two years, just kind of like building my relationships. The second thing about policy, you have to have a legal mind to draft policies. It's not easy. Uh, a lay person just can't sit in the office and say they can write a policy. No, it's not that simple. It takes a lot of years to develop a legal mind to know where to tweak the law at so it can benefit everybody. That comes with time. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting that you said about the drafting of the policy, you need to have a legal mind. Unfortunately, we have a lot of legislators who don't have a legal background, who tend to bring forth policy. So what happens with policies that are brought forth by legislators who don't necessarily have a legal background. So case in point, so Louisiana has over 100 good time laws. Mm -hmm. and Louisiana also has this, this, this practice of keeping people incarcerated beyond their release dates. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because over the years, in the last 25 years, you had different legislators coming to these, in these roles and everybody want to tweak the good time laws tweak mm -hmm. the good time laws. And every year they pass a new good time law without understanding the current laws that are already in place and how those mm -hmm. laws are gonna conflict with each other. And when, it gets to, when the laws become effective, you have lay people who work inside the Department of Correction who have absolutely no legal education. You're requiring them to interpret a 100 conflicting statutes as a result of legislators just passing laws over the years, not realizing how this statute is going to affect that statute. They did that in, in, in so in, in think about how the 2045 law was disrupted. And, and the 25 law coming into effect in the 90s, then the, the legislator passed this 85% law in 1997. But no one knew how this 1997 law would interact or interfere with the 2045 until 20 years later. That's why we have to go back to the legislator and pass Act 122. Because the legislator was saying, I mean, DOC said, this 85% law supersedes the 2045 law. So in order for you to get your 2045 there, you have to do 85%. That's what happened. And so Act 122 came into effect and kind of like cleared some of that, that bad law away. So that's what happened when you have legislators who don't have that legal mind, they just put laws into place and this affect all the other laws and as a result, people stay in prison longer. And so for the people at home who are starting and wanting to be involved, you used the term there, good time. What is good time? Because I don't think a lot of people know what good time is or what it means. So good time is a terminology that's used inside the Department of Correction. The name of it is diminution of sentence. So it's, you get credit for all your good behavior. You get credit for every educational program that you accomplish. You get credit for just overall good things. It's an incentive for you to good, to, for, uh, for good behavior. And they call it good time law, but it's at, the name of the term is diminution of sentence. Okay, so it's a way for people to earn and work towards sort of a beneficial outcome. Yes, so if you maintain, if you achieve all these good time programs, you get certain time knocked off your sentence and it pushes you closer to the door or it comes on the back end where you have a shorter time on parole when you're, at, when you're ultimately released. And some of those things are related to work, education, GED, they aren't just given out. They're, no, Votec, they're Votec, GED programs, college programs, and they have a bunch of self-help programs that are regulated by the Department of Correction that, that allow for good time once you achieve that, complete that program. Okay. Thank you. So, you mentioned that you've been with Vote for, for two years and you still feel like a newbie in this sort of policy analyst role. Um, I think some people who are watching this and some people who are involved in Vote or want to be involved in Vote kind of want to know, like, how do they get involved? So I'm curious, before you answer that question, how did you get involved in policy and becoming a policy analyst? What's your story? So for me, I, I come up under some of the best jailhouse lawyers in Angola. When I got to Angola, and I'm glad I went to Angola first with the amount of time I had, because when I walked in Angola, I remember asking a friend of mine, man, how do I get to the law library? And the next day, he brought me to the law library. I see him at the Norris behind the desk. 
I seen Chico. They had guys named Reginald Morrison, Tucker, Broom. All these guys was in that law library, and I didn't know absolutely nothing about the law, but I knew I had this desire to learn law. And every day I went to that law library, every day I went to the law library, and I went to study and study and study and study and study. Then we had Calvin Duncan teaching us law class on the weekends. That was our saving grace. Those brothers that Norris Anderson, Chico, Randy Tucker, Broom, Reginald Morris, Calvin Duncan, those guys that was like the, 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 the professors of law in that prison. And I learned from them. And I never, and, and the one thing I noticed during my time in prison, everybody that was in the law library was home. Or they was going home. You know what I'm saying, Matthew? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about everybody who was in that law library. When I got there, those brothers was being released. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was on the right path. Mm -hmm. And another inspiring moment for me was that it wasn't easy for them guys to get out. Each one of these brothers' I, names I called, they served 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And I knew eventually if I stay on this path 20 years later, I would get out of prison. And at my 24 mark, my 24 year and 10 month mark, I was walking out of that prison system wow. because of the consistency. I'm talking about just the determination to not die in prison. I refused to die in prison, you know, and that was and that's, that's that's my story. Wow. Glad you're here. Yeah, and and what's even more amazing is the fact that you, as a newbie, new mm -hmm. to policy, mm -hmm. you actually drafted a bill that was pretty successful in legislation. This recent legislation, will tell us something about that. Okay, that's House Bill 55. Uh, it actually has an act number now, I believe it's Act 214. Yes, uh, the governor signed it to law. Uh, there was a mental health bill, so what this bill basically does for the guys on the, the ladies and the men who are currently incarcerated, it does four things. First, it requires Department of Corrections to screen and treat everyone with a PTSD or trauma-related symptom or any mental health diagnosis. The second thing the bill does is require DOC to train staff as well as currently incarcerated people in the recognition of symptoms related to trauma. Uh, the third thing the bill does is require DOC to create what is called closed group therapy, where these guys, can, it's like a safe space where they go at, talk about their traumas, with a qualified physician, somebody that's skilled in mental health. And, uh, and the last thing it does, it requires the Department of Corrections to create what is called discharge plans. This bill will take effect August the 1st. It's called the Mental Healing Act for Incarcerated People. Yes, I did write the bill, but, without the, but, but not without the help of at least 65 mental health professionals mm -hmm. who attended both luncheon prior to the session started, who gave us all the ideas we needed to make sure this bill was the bill we wanted. Awesome. And that's that's gotta be quite an accomplishment. Your first bill you draft gets signed into law. It How does that make you feel? It wasn't the first bill. Now oh, I drafted okay. bills last year, but they all failed. And I drafted <laughs> oh, several okay. bills this year, and they failed, but the, the mental health bill was actually the first bill that passed among many. And I feel good about that, Matt. Good. I feel oh, real good about that. You deserve that. it. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Appreciate that. So you're, are you waiting to get the pen from the governor signing it into law? Yes. So Chico just told me that we have a meeting with the governor on July the 11th. We will go to his office. And he's going to sign the bill and give me a ceremony signing in the picture because of the, the bill I drafted. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's, that picture will go on both walls. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and my girlfriend also want me to get a picture for her, so I got to get two pictures from the governor. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to that. Awesome, awesome. That is, that is amazing. Um, and you also go back into Angola to teach a trauma class. Yes. How is that going? Oh, it's going well. So I just turned in, I just completed the cohort one, which was six weeks mm -hmm. of intense, two hours a day, four different classes. I, and I go into prisons Saturdays and Sundays, teach two classes on Saturdays, two on Sundays, and then for six weeks, the first cohort just graduated. I collected their surveys, sent them to DOC, and blew their mind away. Mm -hmm. 
I'm on the second week in the second cohort, and I will resume that cohort after, I mean, July the 8th, because I'm on vacation right now. But the class is, 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 is going amazing. These guys are learning so much about, and, when I'm, and I think the perspective that I'm offering is a neuroscience perspective. We talk strictly about how trauma impacts the brain. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that is like breakthrough for them because no one had never told them how trauma that occurred when it was a childhood affected them in adulthood for the health outcome. And some of these guys has like five or six and nine ACEs. ACEs is like adverse childhood, childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And I gave them the ACE test and now they see that if you have four more ACEs, then it's safe to say that your health is declining. Mm -hmm. right. And here's some of the things that you can do to reverse the, de the, de the, de the decline of your health. So that's what I'm teaching. I'm actually trying to teach them to save their own lives. Okay, so I want to introduce our other uh, co-worker, Lafayette Chapter Organizer, Miss Samika Minor. Um, and I'll let her tell you guys a little bit about her, her journey. Hello all, my name is Samika Minor, um, also known as Mika. I am one of the Lafayette chapter organizers at VOTE. Um, I became involved with VOTE in 2016. I started off by attending a few meetings and eventually became a member. And what sparked my interest in becoming a member is that um, VOTE had this drive about putting an end to mass incarceration. Um, I'm currently a doctoral candidate majoring in criminal justice with specializations in law and public policy and justice administration. So I want to be an ambassador in the community to help put an end to mass incarceration. Um, my question is for Mr. Norris. Mr. Norris, can you tell me where you envision vote in the next decade? Sky's the limit, be real, sky's the limit. I, I think we have come, and, and a friend of mine has, uh, a voice message on his phone that said, with God, anything is possible. And I believe that. I mean, because I've looked at how we've been blessed. Um, people ask me how I'm doing. I'm saying I'm blessed. Because when I look at this journey, this journey started 47 years ago. And nobody, I didn't even envision being where we're at today. When folks ask me all the time, they say, man, did you ever see Vogue being where we at? I'm saying, no, I never thought we would be where we're at today. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful that, you know, God has chosen me to be the vehicle that uh, this work is going through, you know. So, no, I, I see this, this, this is, you know, like I said again, the sky's the limit on about what we can do because the, the more we educate people, you know, we start off about educating, organizing, and mobilizing, you know. That's, that's our, 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 our claim to fame. And the biggest thing, our strength becomes because we're willing to fight one day longer than the next person. And when I say about fight, it's like when we talked about policy work, we talk about advocacy work, is that we're in this uh, for the long haul. We, we're kind of like directly impacted. we system impacted people. Our families are vicariously impacted by this stuff. And so we don't have the luxury to quit. We don't have the luxury to quit. So our opportunities now is that we can take this as far as we can see and I, I have that down the street around the corner vision so you know ain't no telling where we gonna end up at okay thank you no surrender no, no retreat. retreat no surrender no, no retreat. retreat no surrender no retreat Thank you, Acadiana, for tuning in to our brand new TV series, From Chains to Change. To learn more about VOTE, visit our website at www.voiceoftheexperience.org. We welcome you to attend our next monthly meeting held on July 19th at the Downtown Convention Center located at 124 South Buchanan Street from 6 o'clock p.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. 
No surrender, no, no retreat. retreat.